So I have to say, I have a love-hate relationship with this book. <laughs> and I've told Julian this. I mean, it is the juxtaposition of adrenaline rush and gut punches throughout the entire thing. Um, and I think one of the major statements that stands out to me is everywhere she turned, she felt as if society were telling her she needed to be less of a success at work and to be more of a success at home. So in thinking about this book, can women really have it all? Uh, you know, it's one of the themes of the book, and it's great to be here, by the way. Thank you for hosting us. Love doing Google Talks. Thank you for your interview questions. Um, you know, it is, it is a big issue for women, uh, whether you are here at Google or whether you are, you know, across the globe, and that is the unequal uh, pay, un unequal work at home, the unpaid work at home. I, th I believe in a quote by Ruth Bader Ginsburg who says, you can't have it all, all at once. So that's what I would say, is that you can have it all at different times um, or parts of that, but it's a myth to say that you can have it all, all at once. And Sonia, yeah, I would love to hear your yeah, take on Yeah, you know, it. it's funny because I went through a, um, in the book, you know, I had, I went through a process where I had a, a child and um, breast cancer at the same time. And I really had to think like, what was I doing? Right. And I wanted to have a family and also wanted to have a career. And I did some soul searching and I said, well, what is it that defines who I am? And I came up with one little sentence and it was basically investing in people and companies that matter. Right. I didn't ever want to quit uh, the venture industry because I think it's important for women especially and even men too is to always have a foot in somewhere, right? Never just leave your job um, and just do, I'm, I'm quitting, I'm just going to stay at home. I mean, you, you can do that, but have a foothold in something that, that keeps you relevant, that keeps you interesting. And so when w one of the things I did is I founded Broadway Angels, which is a group of women, all women, and we're all alpha girls. And um, you have to have measurable success to be a Broadway angel. And what we do is we share deals and due diligence. So it's half venture capitalists and half founding entrepreneurs. And many of them, you know, are retired from their, their big job, but they are staying relevant by being a Broadway angel and seeing, you know, what uh, new technologies are happening or new things happening in consumers, uh, with consumers. And so they, be, they maintain their relevancy, which keeps them relevant, which keeps them engaged, but they're also spending time with families and doing other things. And so um, I think women can have it all, but you have to really ask yourself, what does all mean to you, right? Like you can't have all, like society says, a full-time job and, you know, being a perfect, you know, housewife or whatever. But what, what, what does all mean to you? And I think if you can get to that answer, you can have it all. And that's how I've been living my life my whole life. So. <laughs> um, another quote that I really liked from the book said, the best revolutionaries are not the people who hate the dictators, but those who empathize with the victims. And I, I do want to point out, you know, Julian, you did such a great job focusing on statements like, you know, men use philanthropy to advance themselves, but women use philanthropy to care for others. Or, you know, and it's not about your network, it's about, it, or just your network, it's about building relationships. And so when we think about being a revolutionary, in that regard, I'd love to know from either of you, or both of you actually, what advice would you give to women who want to do something revolutionary in their careers or in their lives? Well, it was very interesting to me to do this book, which was, which is focused on women. There are great men in the book, and then there are men who didn't behave as well, but this is very much focused on women. And my prior books had focused on kind of these hard-charging men. And so I really noticed differences in how women succeed and become revolutionaries. And it's actually, maybe will sound counterintuitive, but I think that um, there is something that I have uh, kind of connected with, and it's a term called tempered radicals. And it's about how 
we can make incremental change that adds up to something really significant, i.e. revolutionary, where women often will, again, succeed. It's one small success at a time. And sometimes it means, you know, playing in the case of the story that I wrote, it's about playing by the rules that were defined by others in, in many cases. And those rules were very much defined by men. Uh, I write about this world of venture capital where 94% of all check writing VCs were men. The figure is similar today, a little bit improved. But um, to be a revolutionary, you have to learn kind of, you know, you learn how to play the game. And at the same time, you're advancing yourself and your career by doing all sorts of things that these women of the book did very successfully. You can also, I've learned, advance the causes that are important to you. And I think that that is revolutionary. So I think we should look at revolutionaries or radicals, not just as those who um, are the Rosa Parks, who with one defiant act will spark a movement, uh, the civil rights movement, refusing to give up or seat on the bus. I think all of us can be revolutionaries with kind of incremental victories that add up to something really significant. And that's a big part of, uh, of the story of this book and you know, Sonia's success and many of the other women who, again, played by the rules, achieved huge success and did so with these small victories along the way. And now they can trailblaze. Now they can lift, you know, they're lifting other women up. Um, so I think it's a very accessible sort of way of thinking about being a revolutionary. So I, I think that quote is attributed to me. Um, <laughs> well, there was method to my madness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, I literally lived live through the hardest eight months of my life, which is in the book, which is shocking that I even told Julian about it. But um, having a baby and having breast cancer at the same time is a really tough time, right? And um, I could have whined a lot about, you know, how hard it was for me at that time. But what it really did was it opened my eyes to how hard it is to be a woman at work with a family. And and how few women there were that were working full-time jobs. There just weren't even a lot of, of examples of what do you do when your partner has, uh, you know, as a new child and, and breast cancer. And there just really weren't a lot of examples. So instead of complaining, which I am not a complainer, and it's sincere, Jillian, um, you know, I, I always view obstacles as my allies. So instead of complaining and blaming somebody, which is so easy to do all the time, I decided I was going to change things. And I was going to bring awareness to the women in venture capital. And now we have Broadway Angels. But I was, always, I was also going to help other women and girls to believe in themselves so that they can do something. And so that's why I started Project Glimmer. Um, and it was all because I felt really awful for an eight-month period. And, and I was just determined not to let that that experience defined me, and I realized I couldn't even keep that those feelings if I wanted to, even today, because nothing stays stays permanent, and um, and changed the world. And I have changed just a little bit. I don't have to change the entire world. And I think a lot of people think when they want to do something revolutionary, they have to change everything. You don't have to boil the ocean. You can do one thing at a time. And you know, with Project Glimmer, we started out giving eight hundred gifts during the holidays to the San Francisco Firefighters Toy Program. And since that time, we've now served, I think, over a million people, uh, women and girls. We have in-person mentorship programs. We, we do all this incredible stuff. But at the time when I started, I didn't plan to start a nonprofit that was going to change the lives of many, many, many women and girls. And so, so I would just encourage everyone in the room, if you see a problem, stop complaining about it and start doing something. And that's how we'll solve it. Let's follow up just a little bit on that. Um, so we're talking about playing the game. Mm -hmm. When, I believe it's Teresa, is getting a divorce and has done incredible work lifting up fellow male partners as well as you know, other colleagues, she's forced to tell all of her clients in her book that she's getting a divorce. I mean, some of the most humiliating things, I mean, you babysat when you first got started. I know we've all done these things at some point, or I mean, I've gone and gotten, you know, someone's dry cleaning and, and someone's lunch, even here at Google a few years ago, I was still doing some of those types of things. Have we changed the game even incrementally? Well, it's interesting. All jobs have challenges, every single one. And again, it's back to the complaining thing, right? And you have to look at 
your job in a strategic way? Like, how do you win? Right. And you can, of course, complain about all kinds of things or you could win. Right. And so I talk about dressing for work. Right. And I think women have a higher standard about what kind of clothes they should wear because they're immediately judged by their, um, by their appearances. And it's the most controversial comment I have. I say, wear Banana Republic, but think like Coco Chanel. Like that's how women should dress for work. And, um, that falls on deaf ears here at Google. You yeah, know I know. That, right? well, Google's different. I mean, you guys are so cool. You can wear whatever you want. But, you know, but for, for venture capitalists, women in finance, et cetera, you know, you're, you're, with so few women, you have to change your, the way you dress. And it's a very controversial comment because a lot of people are saying, well, I'm not going to give up who I am by wearing, you know, your, your formula for success because I am the kind of person I like to wear halter tops or whatever. But it's not about giving up who you are. It's about winning the game. It is a tactic to your strategy for winning. And so if you can change your tactics, that's not giving up who you are. But if that's the way the rules are, and that's how you win, you want to do that. And then once you do win, you can change the rules, right? But you can't change the rules from the bottom. And so I think, I think things have changed um, remarkably for women. Um, you know, I think the Me Too movement really helped um, because all of a sudden what was in darkness became light. And we see it, we're seeing it over and over and over and over and over again in every single industry. And um, I think behavior is just getting better. And women are also not the only one anymore. So if there's an issue, you can bring it up and it is addressed. And that never happened before the Me Too movement ever. And so I think it really has gotten better. And I think men are also so aware and so part of this, of this, uh, movement. Um, so I, I think it really has changed, uh, dr dramatically. And not to have fallen into that pattern of, Hey, I was just focusing on women based questions. As I prepared for this, I want to tap into that a little bit. Um, how can women and, and leaders like yourselves who are influencers and, and voices here, how can we bring men into the conversations that we want to have. I mean, you said something to the effect, I think, Julian, in the book that, you know, gender inequality is every gender's responsibility and, and problem. It's not just one uh, gender's problem. Um, so, you know, how can men shine a light on their female counterparts and, and how can we equip them with the types of things we need to hear? Um, or how do we start that conversation for them? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of with the book is that there are these great guys in the book, these great men in the book who were fantastic allies to the women when the women were the only, you know, they were the onlys, they were the sole woman at the table. And, um, you know, they had these male, either mentors or they had a guiding force or they had the guy around them in Teresa Gao's case who would tell them the locker room talk, uh, what the guys in the Valley were saying when they were landing deals. Um, so there are great, which by the way was just to be clear mm -hmm. with the audience who hasn't read, that was not great feedback of an emotional stance, but it let her know where she stood in the Valley. Correct. Right. Right. So Teresa Gao, you know, I tell, I tell these stories of these women coming to uh, Silicon Valley and their backstories and their family stories. And in Teresa's case, coming from Jakarta, Indonesia. And it was a long journey actually for all of these women and a really, really powerful one, big dreams. But Teresa then became a venture capitalist and she's at a firm with all men and she's chasing down these big, big deals and landing them. She had specialized in cybersecurity, which is another great message for women uh, to specialize in something make yourself invaluable and be more quantitative, uh, which is always uh, a good thing. And that's what Teresa did. But she chased down one big cybersecurity deal uh, called Web Cohort, which would become Imperva and uh, found out that the guys in the Valley were talking about, you know, kind of undermining her accomplishments with her talk by making suggestions that uh, she didn't get the deal through her talents, through her talents as a VC. So, um, you know, stuff that could have derailed her, could have really upset her. And it was her male ally who told her this. And, you know, she just let it go, but was glad she knew and was more determined than ever to continue to succeed. Um, so there are great male allies in the book and ones who uh, really were very instrumental. And I think the women were very savvy as well about um, who they 
um, develop these kind of professional partnerships with. I think for the men out there, I think there are all sorts of ways that you can really be a great ally. You know, one of the things just to realize is women's stories don't get told nearly enough. I mean, whether it's in history or whether it is, you know, uh, across media today. And, you know, even when you're, when you see uh, stories about wim women economists uh, versus men, even the head size is, is smaller for women, uh, studies have shown. So tell women's stories when you're tweeting, when you're on social media, if you, you know, can raise up a woman around you, we all can do something. We all can, you know, however incremental, going back to how to be a radical or a revolutionary, you know, we all can do something. Um, you know, men can, again, tell the stories of the women around, tell your stories, tell the stories of the amazing women around you, whether your colleagues, your friends, uh, your relatives, just to get their faces and their names and more gender balance. So that's one really significant uh, way I think that men can be allies. There are all sorts of things in meetings where um, if the woman is the lead, say, on a deal or on a project, but yet all the questions keep going to the man at the table, uh, for a man to step in and say, I think, you know, Sonia is really the expert here. Let's direct the questions to her, they shouldn't be coming to us. So men can be very proactive in that way. And uh, those are just two suggestions that I would have. Tell their stories, raise them up, and think about, you know, and I think this book really helps in terms of seeing the world from women's eyes and viewpoint. What is it like to be the only or one of the only women at the table? Um, you know, what does it look like from their perspective? So I think it's a very powerful book, actually, for men as well, I hope. So I think what um, men can do is, is think about hiring. Um, you know, we all have our decoder rings on what makes a great candidate for a job. And typically, it's usually someone who looks just like us, right? And, you know, I think that's why the venture industry is so male dominated and um, white is because there's just all white men in the industry. But if you think about a new position, um, make sure at least half the candidates for the position are d diverse. And there is a venture capitalist who is famously quoted um, as saying that his venture firm didn't want to lower their standards to hire a woman. And that didn't go well for him. Um, <laughs> Not at Good. all, actually. <laughs> um, but the thing is that the standards change, right? So what makes a venture capital great? Maybe a man has to have a CEO experience and um, has to um, have taken a company public or something like that and have an engineering degree. Um, maybe that's one criteria, but I actually don't fit the mold of what would make a, a great venture capitalist because I don't have an engineering degree. I don't have very much operating experience, very little actually, um, but I was investor of the year, you know, six out of 17 years. And it's because I have different skills. It's because I understand large markets. I understand business models. I, I do other things and I win the deals, which is key to, to being a great venture capitalist. And so with the criteria for any job, I think you should maybe alter it a little bit because for, for one reason, there are very few women CEOs who've taken a company public in the world. I think Julie Wainwright just went public um, for the real real. And of the thousands of companies that went public on the NASDAQ, I think only 20 of them had women CEOs. And so if that's your criteria for venture capital, the pool is, is much smaller. So that needs to change. And so I think hiring is really key and changing the hiring criteria. And, and if I may add one thing, you had asked about whether we've made progress. And Sonia is very optimistic, and uh, and that is truly how she is, which is wonderful. Uh, but you know, as I got into this project, I began to see how uh, pervasive these inequities really are, and how they continue today. And I got into this very much as a journalist. Um, and I walked out still as a journalist, but very much feeling like an activist because you look at the numbers and you look at the underrepresentation across industries, uh, between only five and 20% of the top management ranks really across industries, uh, are held by women. So I see this as a really critical point in, in time, a critical moment, kind of a call to action 
uh, to affect change. And yes, there are these pockets of great promise. What you see Sonia doing, what you see Teresa Gao, and some women uh, really across the country who are spearheading this to affect change, to bring more extraordinary women into these positions of power. But there are also these numbers which are pretty dire, pretty abysmal. But I do want to give a plug to my partners. My partners were pretty great. Um, you know, they did take a chance on me and they hired me at a very young age, you know, without the proper criteria. And even when I was going through the hard times, they kept my job and they paid 100% of my salary and health insurance. I, so, you know, those things were amazing. And so I want to make sure that I give them a plug for that. For sure. And yeah. perhaps, and it's worth, yeah. I, I remember thinking this, I'm like, well, would they have called, because I did call out, okay, they didn't call Sonia during um, her battle with cancer when she was away from the office. Would they have done that for a male colleague? Probably, Probably not. not. <laughs> <laughs> so they, if nothing else, they treated you as they would have treated their male colleagues. And that's isn't that what we're really asking for, at least to start with? Right. Yeah. Um, I want to drill down a little bit more into the venture capitalist entrepreneur relationship, because I think there are a lot of folks in this room who have great ideas. We're different ages. We're wondering, you know, what makes a great idea? What do you look for? I know you look for passions and things that are relevant to you. Um, I know sometimes when you would get a pitch in the room at Menlo, if no one else knew what it was about or how it related at all, they were like, Sonia, what do you think? So what do you look for? Well, first thing I, I look for is a large market um, because if you don't have a market, your company will always lose. Um, you don't have to have the best CEO or the best founder or even your technology doesn't always have to work perfectly in the beginning because those things you can fix, but you can't fix a market. Um, so I, I, I lead with market all the time. Um, also, I think the entrepreneur has to have some specialized knowledge about the problems that those markets have, some kind of unique insight that um, that they have that other people may not, uh, that will provide great foundation for what kind of company they want to start. Um, and then, you know, you have to have the ability to build a, a great team, like an idea that's it's that's that's strong enough that you could hire really great people. And as we all know, how hard it is to hire people. Um, and then finally you have to have a great business model and it's, it's kind of funny with the rise of consumers, uh, that kind of has gone out the door <laughs> and I'm, I'm, if someone says, what's your hobby? My hobby is business models. I love business models. Even project glimmer has a great business model. Like we give away 90% gross margin things that are last season, right? It's, it's not like we're giving away milk, right? <laughs> and so you want to have a really great business model. And so those are the things that you do and, and just really have a passion. So I, I was at Harvard Business School a couple of years ago and they have the idea lab there. And there was an, an ad that people post, it was kind of ironic, it was paper, but on, on, the, on the bulletin board it said, engineer looking for a great idea. That's the worst way to start. The worst, <laughs> like absolute worst. It's got to be the great idea looking for, you know, engineers because you can't just you have to have the passion for starting a business um, that's really in your heart because starting a business is really hard. And if and if you don't wake up every morning excited, excited about what problem you're solving, you're, you're probably not going to get out of bed. So you need to be very, very passionate because it's really, really hard being an entrepreneur. I want to I want to talk a little bit more, too, because I believe it's in your story where as the venture capitalist who convinces her partners or convinces partners we're going to we're going to invest in this we're getting you know the funding what whatever you know uh, round of funding it is you actually work with that entrepreneur founder mm -hmm. and you asked him at the end of the conversation when he was pitching or doing a conversations like how do you feel right so that's that's the famous story and it's so surprising that that's probably brought up the most when my story in Alpha Girls, it's basically I'm on the board of, of Acme Packet, which is a company that went public and was sold to Oracle for billions of dollars after they went public. And, billions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, billions of dollars, right? Um, and Andy Ori, I've, I've backed him three times now. I'm on his board for 128 Technologies as well. And it, it, he's, he's just the one who told the story, but any one of my CEOs could have told the story where after the board meeting, you know, you present 
the plan and did you meet the plan? And of course, companies never meet the plan ever, ever, <laughs> ever, 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 especially if they're private. So like missing the plan is really not always indicate an indicator if the company's doing well or not. And they present the sales and whatever the other things that they present in board meetings are. And then you go home and um, that's supposedly the end of the board meeting until the next one. But but I like to call the entrepreneurs the next day and I ask them how they're feeling. Because if they feel they have been beat up in the board meeting, they're going to tell me. They're going to be like, well, it was really rough last night. I was like barely asleep because, you know, I was so worried. If they're like, oh, no, I feel more better than ever because I know that pipeline is so strong and, you know, we're going to do great. So then I really find out how the company is doing. You really don't find out how the company is doing during the board meeting. You find out the day after. And and I'm almost afraid that now everybody else knows my secret, right? It was my competitive advantage. Now the world knows. But but if you ask someone how they're feeling the next day, they're going to tell you. And and you're going to get some real insights in how business is doing. Because business is not just about the numbers. It's about so many other things that are non-measured. But I think just to your point, and it was a throwaway, like I've backed him three times now. I right. mean, it's about right. building that relationship. It's about trust. It's not just about who you know, and the numbers. Right. So with um, the Perkins Fund, one third of the entrepreneurs that I have backed I have are pr prior entrepreneurs that I've backed before. So I actually view that as my report card. And I think when you are talking to venture capitalists, you should ask them that number. How many entrepreneurs do you have that you've backed in the past? Because a lot of VCs have zero, right? And you really want someone that's on your team. And, you know, I don't look at it as an us versus them. I look at it as a we because we are going to do this together. And I provide the capital and they provide the hard work, sweat and tears. I mean, I pretty provide not very much compared to what entrepreneurs provide. But if we are having a problem, we're going to work on it together. And, and if you start pointing fingers and blaming, you might as well just write the whole company off. So it's a we thing. It's not an us versus them thing. And I think that's very unique to women, right? Very I, unique. I totally agree. Um, and I want to talk a little bit now about that pipeline for up-and-coming venture capitalists and entrepreneurs. Um, we obviously don't have enough women in that, in that realm. And even Melinda Gates says we've got to get them into technology before we can get them to the table, you know, and, and as an entrepreneur, then on the venture capitalist side as well. Um, how do we do that? Whereas, I mean, I think part of that inspiration is you are working together. That's more of this younger generation of being collaborative and, and leaning on each other. And also women of color, just that diversity right. level. Well, I, you know, I, I always say you can't be what you can't see, which is why I'm so grateful for Jillian for writing this book. Because her, her question was, where are the women when she was researching what topics she was going to write her next book on? And they're really were no women in the press. There's no women. People didn't think there were any women. And of the few women that were in the industry, we're like, we're here, we're here. And hopefully the reason why I was so open to talking to Julian about this book, and it's very private. This is my private life that the whole world's reading about, right? But the reason why I was so open to doing that is because I wanted to inspire women and girls to get into technology and to become venture capitalists because the world needs more women in venture. I mean, there are so many examples of technologies that have been funded that are not good for society. And women don't do that. I mean, I invest in people and companies that matter in general. And I would never invest in a game company designed to addict children. Like, why would you do that, right? And so that's why, we, that's why I'm very, very, very uh, strong about this point is that we just need to have uh, venture capitalists that are investing not only for financial gain, but for societal gain. And that just needs to be out there, especially with global warming, with all kinds of issues that our society is facing. And we know now that tech and venture capital is the beginning of foundations of society. And that needs to, needs to change. Julian, I know your perspective is slightly different, but you are from a journalistic background. You're in, you've come from the heart of Silicon Valley. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how would you inspire young women or really any age, whether we're mid-career, what have you, to go into um, this, you know, inspiration for venture capitalism and entrepreneurship. Well, I think the the stories in the book uh, are inspiration. Even though the women were uh, broadsided at times, they love this industry. They love tech. They love venture capital. They love entrepreneurs who are eternal optimists. 
they have to be or they wouldn't do it, uh, extremely hard workers. So I think the story shows that women are great at this, women love it, and maybe those two, it's the chicken or egg question, uh, women are good at it because they love it. Um, despite the challenges, they are still in it. I think that uh, one big thing, and this is an interesting subject that came up in the book, is money and women and the issue of money, which is also fraught for women. It's much more complicated for women than it is for men. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting, important point to discuss, that it's great for women, especially at a younger age, to make, well, at any age, to make a lot of money, because with money is power, and we need to get more money into the hands of more women. So I think that that's actually a really positive thing and a game changer, potentially, uh, because of the influence that it wields. So I would say, uh, you know, I hope that the stories of the book, uh, as they're adapted also for, for the screen, that that inspires people and makes you think, oh, well, you know, look at Sonia Perkins. She, you know, helped her investments really made the internet safer and faster. Look at Teresa Gao, you know, the deals that she landed. Magdalena Yashil came from Istanbul, Turkey with nothing, with $43, became an electrical engineer, helped build a little company called Salesforce.com. Um, MJ Elmore drove west in her old Ford Pinto and lands a job at a company called Intel and goes on to become one of the first women in history to make partner at a venture capital firm. All of these women are in the game today. And so I think they are these phenomenal stories and role models and, you know, with the failures and the successes, this is not just, you know, an upward trajectory all the way. So um, I hope it's that. And then I hope also just, you know, this issue around money should be one that uh, should not be as complicated for women as it is. It's, it's okay to admit we enjoy it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we don't even do that. And, and that falls into one of my favorite um, statements from the book that also still makes me hyperventilate, which is um, you don't have to obey the rules. <laughs> um, I'd love to open it up for questions in the audience. Do we have some? If there's anyone, well, I'm going to keep asking some questions, but the first person who is inspired, either raise your hand and I'll toss out the cube or um, feel free to walk up. I'd love to know, Julian, where do you think the next industry or uh, area for women in, and disruption is? Where do you think we need to look next? Well, I actually think it's across industries, as I said, where I think it's, um, you know, I recently spoke to a group of women architects, women builders, where they're trying to bring in more women and kind of rally the troops of women who are there. I think that disruption, you know, one area uh, or one actually way to disrupt is to form women's networks. And I see that happening across industries more and more, whether it's in, you know, at law firms, whether it's in women home builders. Uh, and a part of this story really is about how these women, they started out as the only, but now they're at this place where they've created, as Sonia has said, uh, these really powerful women's networks. And men are an important, very important part of that network as well. But I think there's power for disruption uh, when women get together. Sonia? I think it's in politics. Um, our, 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 our government is basically white male. And even though we had more women in Congress um, than ever, than ever <laughs> it's still a very small number compared to our population. And so I just would ask people to support women candidates, um, even the ones for the debate stage, even if you're not going to vote for them for president, but just to have more diverse voices heard in politics. And so many decisions are, are being made about our health, about our, our lives, um, by people who have no idea who we are. Yes, question. Cool. Hello. Testing. All right. Uh, so my name is LJ Irwin. I lead the West Coast program for Google Cloud for Startups. I notice often that whether whether it's women or other underrepresented minorities, often it feels like whether you're in tech or in venture capital or in, in law, that you're like the only one. So when you were rising up the ranks, whether you're a reporter or as a venture capital capitalist, 
what strategies did you use to align yourself with other individuals your age or in your kind of cohort and to build those alliances so you didn't feel like you were always the only one rising up as opposed to being a part of a team? Can you tell us any type of strategies that you used to build that network? Yeah, it's kind of funny. I didn't really have any strategies. And in hindsight, I wish I had. Um, you know, I, I used to walk around and just talk about people are people and there was no difference and we all have the same minds and, you know, the whole thing. And, um, you know, there was like a young venture capital association network where, you know, I met some people, but I really didn't. And, and actually in 2008 when, or 2010, which is where I really, um, you know, needed some advice. I really didn't have anybody who understood, um, what my situation was. I literally had no one I trusted that I could ask these questions to. And so the strategy I would, I would have told my younger self is to network with people like, like starting like a Broadway angels, you know, younger. And that's been phenomenal where people are your peers and, and they're like you, um, and you can have a voice, right? I mean, you'd, you'd really want the voice more than anything and you want to be uh, respected. So I would, I would maybe even have a formal network that you put together and maybe Google can sponsor it and, and, and have, have likes because you really do need to have your trusted friend who really gets your job and really gets you who you can ask like the really hard questions for. And I, I didn't have that, um, when I, when I needed it. Do you feel like it's a challenge to identify those peers in like a zero sum industry like venture capital? No, because I started Broadway Angels and we have 52 members and everybody wants to be one, which is like shocking. And it's 10 years later. And, and it's, it's, we're a force. Like everybody knows Broadway Angels. We've, I've been told that we're the number one angel group in the world, not just the women angel group, but angel group, because we are the top venture capitalists and top entrepreneurs. And we see everything we see. I mean, people, we, Sarah Flint and Argent and, um, Hint Water. I mean, we're in all these great companies and people love having us. So it's awesome. So I solved the problem, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, one in the back. Can you want to toss it? So cool. Um, hi, my name is Olivia. I also work with LJ. But um, I started a, a women's book club and we read your, your book just last month with um, Jennifer and it was phenomenal. I, I really love that there's just different um, chapters that you guys go through in your life. And um, I think there is a quote where it's, um, you're on a boat and you it's so easy to kind of look at the day to day and kind of feel a little seasick and that you have to look at the horizon and just kind of go towards that. So um, my question to you is looking back at what you've done, like what would you tell your 20 something year old self? Like, I mean, I, I think a lot of us are focusing on careers, maybe like growing a family and things like that, but there's gonna be different chapters in your life that will change, but what's that horizon? What's that one thing that you always have to keep looking for reminding yourself? To be aware. Of. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to do with like your passion for what the work is. And so I was always so passionate about investing in entrepreneurs and changing the world through investments. Um, and so that was just, it was so easy for me. I mean, nothing else really mattered, to be perfectly honest. Like all the, I, the book is very wonderful in the stories, but like all the little slights, like really, it's like water off a duck's back. Like, you know, it was like winning. It was investing in these companies. It was changing the world, um, investing in Andy Ori three times. Right. I mean, that, that's what it was about. And so I, I would just, just say, focus on your passion and, and finding out what it is that you get excited about. And you can still do those other things, maybe in different ratios. You know, now when you're all young, work your hardest, <laughs> like have no balance because, because you're going to need balance later. And so you're going to need to have your, um, your reserves built up, which is what I did. I worked nonstop until I was like 42. So literally nonstop. And, and, um, I would just add to that a story in the book about MJ Elmore, the one who drove the Pinto West and starts at Intel. So she, as we do in our lives, she starts adding on with a husband and with three children and she's working, you know, her husband works full time at a venture firm in the Valley and she's full time. And, um, she makes the mistake of being really the one at home who does the lion's share of the work. She's the go-to parent uh, for the kids, and she's taking care of aging parents. And when the marriage starts to falter, she's the one who 
decides to step back and no one says, well, why doesn't your partner do that? Or um, the question never comes up. So today, MJ says, I mean, keep your foot in the door, but she, and she doesn't blame her now ex-husband, who's a great guy. She doesn't blame him. She almost blames herself because she says that her overachieving, doing everything, thinking she could, you know, it was easier to do it herself than to ask for help. Her overachieving in a way enabled his underachievement at home. So ask for help, set the responsibilities, who's going to do what, you know, when you find a partner, um, you know, talk about these things, talk about, you know, when you have kids, what's going to happen, uh, when there's networking at night, you know, and you want to do this, uh, you know, make sure that it's going to be equitable because that is one of the biggest things that continues to derail women. Um, so there are really important lessons that I hadn't thought of in the way that, that are told through these stories. Thank is there you. anything that you wish you had done differently? No. I mean, <laughs> I, I, not, not one thing. I wouldn't change one experience in my life, even the bad ones, um, or ones that would be perceived as bad, because I think that what happens to you in your lifetime kind of creates who you are. Right. And I look at myself now and I love myself, you know, it's, so I wouldn't change a thing because sometimes hardship makes you stronger. It gives you wisdom and insight. And so, you know, when you, when you have the hard things that happen, you just look at it. Like, how can I turn this into my friend? Like, how can this be a career building instead of career limiting? Obstacles are Our allies. allies. It's so fun because there's so, there you you hear you see Sonia's personality, which is completely authentic, and then each woman in in the book they have very different personalities. So it's it's fun for me to now listen to Sonia, and I know how authentic she is and how much she really believes in this. Obstacles are my allies. That's how she looks at life. And the easy way or the hard way, right? Why don't you live your life the easy way? And it's all in your head. Everything that happens to you is really processed through your own head. And if you can just get out of your own head and say, okay, well, this isn't so bad. Or this, look at all these great things. It, it just, it's like magical. Like we choose our own happiness. It's amazing. And once you realize you have that power that you choose your own happiness, guess what? You can choose to be happy. Sound like you live in California. No, I mean, <laughs> anywhere, anywhere. It's just, it's so simple. You'd it's never so, know you're from Virginia. <laughs> I mean, you're sorry, Pittsburgh, didn't by the way, UVA. Yep. Another question. Are you going to toss it over that way? Yep. Oh. <laughs> Not known for our athletic skills. <laughs> All right, I've got it. Um, so, Sonia, I'm wondering, you mentioned that when you first broke into VC, you were 29. And... No, I was 22. Oh, 22. Okay. okay, 22, and you didn't fit the criteria for a venture capitalist. So how did you win over your partners? Like, how did you get them to take a chance on you? Yeah, so when I first started in TA, um, a, a professor of mine, Neil Snyder, actually introduced me to one of the partners at TA Associates, and they the, they ask, who's your best student or your favorite student? And I was luckily that person. And um, so I worked really hard in college, and, and people noticed. But also, um, I graduated from college in 1988, and so in the late 80s, the PC was just coming to become a business tool, and nobody had a, co a computer in college. You hand-typed your papers and things. So it, I, I was really interested in PCs and, and um, networking, and so I worked in the computer lab. I was a programmer um, at the Department of Neurosurgery at UVA, and I, I did all these jobs because my parents didn't give me uh, any money for for clothes. And, um, if you were a computer programmer, you got paid $8 versus $4 at the gym. And so I'm very grateful that they did not give me the money. Cause I had all of a sudden I had these skills. And so TA had just figured out the software industry, which the venture industry really didn't value for a long time because your engineers go home at night and they thought that was the value versus it was a wonderful business model where you could make something once and sell it over and over. And so they had invested in mainframe and mid-range, but they didn't have any partners that understood PC software. And even though I didn't really understand it as people today understand it, but I knew more than anyone else. And so I brought something very unique to the table. And, um, and then while I was at TA, I invested in three companies and all three of them went public, including McAfee Associates. So when I got to um, uh, Menlo Ventures, I had a really great track record and they didn't have any expertise in security. And I had done a lot of security investing at the time, even though I was young I, and also had worked for Symantec while I was at business school, the same clothing problem I had in business school. <laughs> and so, um, so that was basically it. So I think in order to get 
in on a venture capital firm, you need to bring something unique to the table. And I think now, I think with AI, machine learning, um, a, a Bitcoin and blockchain, like a lot of VCs don't have strong expertise in that. So, you know, maybe get in a group that is a, a new technology that, that may be taking off. I think Sonia's being a little modest, too, because her story of McAfee, when you read it in the book, is pretty compelling. She cold called and just nailed it eventually. But it's pretty impressive, and it, it kind of lends to a couple of the things that Julian speaks of through an assistant, I believe, of Teresa's describing her. But you talk about it, – it, it is the alpha woman to me because you talk about um, – you say here um, – She's not afraid to take risks in an industry that isn't female-friendly. She shares the spotlight and empowers other women. She's philanthropic and cares about issues. But she really is a risk-taker, and I think that's, you know, yep. not afraid to fail. Wired had that, rewrote it, um, or took the book, the McAfee story. You should just Google the Wired, the Wired article. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I've got to go read that now. Yeah. <laughs> Another question, yes. Hey, um, so I resist the term girls when applied to me or other adult women. Can you comment a little bit on the title and whether that's, you know, why out and why not alpha women? Um, I feel like there is great power in girls and girls are brave and girls are happy and girls are joyous and girls are smart. And I like the juxtaposition of that, of that word with the word alpha um, and I think that however old we are, we can all be girls. Oh, let's get together with the girlfriends. I think it should be a badge of honor. You don't think it's infantilizing to some extent? I think this is something I've been struggling internally with a lot because I, I'm wearing a pink frilly skirt as I ask this question, right? Um, but looking at my three-year-old daughter, I think what this translates to is this like desire for cuteness and that we as women have to always strive for a certain like cuteness even as a woman in tech, right? So... How do, I mean, I struggle. Well, I think this is just the opposite of <laughs> cuteness. I think this is uh, brain power, it's tenacity, and it is using, um, you know, hard work and, again, brain power to make your dreams a reality. So if that's cute, then that's cute. Uh, but I think it's about strength and I think it's about tenacity and I think it's about bravery and I think it's about trailblazing. And I think it's about, uh, being one of these everyday radicals, these tempered radicals who get to a point where they can trailblaze. So I love the title. Um, I've heard this question before and it's fine. Titles are tricky. Uh, the title also attracted Kathy Shulman, who, is the Academy Award winning producer who's adapting it uh, for television. She saw it on her desk, piles of, it was a proposal at that stage. And she was like, oh, this title, there's something about this title that grabs you, um, that pulls you in, that makes you curious about it. And then the subtitle, subtitles have gotten very long, The Women Upstarts Who Took On Silicon Valley's Male Culture and Made the Deals of a Lifetime. So we do have women in the subtitle. <laughs> I think, too, when you read the book, you'll hear these four women, and I think of Magdalena in particular, you learn that they have these alpha girl traits as you've learned them in childhood. Your, the mothers gave them a lot of, you know, or helped cultivate. So it's not like they hit their professional womanhood and said, now I'm an alpha. That's you grew really, up that yeah, way. that's a really interesting point. Um, because I do tell the stories of these women when they were children and these kind of pivotal moments, you know, where actually the fathers had really, really key roles, which is another great lesson to be a male ally to all the dads out there. This is pretty profound. It was for Sonia. It remains so for Sonia and uh, actually for all of the women who were very inspired as girls by their fathers. And the question, oh, yes, behind you. Um, this is a question for Sonia. First of all, thanks for um, sharing your experiences. This has been a very rewarding talk. Um, I'm fascinated with your ability to read markets. How did you learn to do that? And also, when did you know you were successful? When was the first moment that you knew that you were successful? Oh my gosh, I, I, don't, I don't even know. Um, 
I, I think I always believed in myself. And so I probably didn't even think about what success was. Um, it was more about just doing what I was passionate about. Um, but reading markets is actually much easier than you think. Maybe it's a woman thing. Um, what you have to do is ask people what are their problems that they need to have solved, right? And that's why you don't have to understand technology to actually be a great venture capitalist because, like, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how a semiconductor is made, right? But I know that processing power is important, right? And so, you know, one example um, was this company called F5, right? And F5 was the leading load balancing company when the internet was getting started. And the big problem was that there were these latency issues and, and, and traffic wasn't well managed between um, servers when people kept growing their websites. And so I just asked companies what were their issues and they said latency is a problem. I'm like, huh, I wonder what companies are solving that. And Cisco is solving, solving it in a very poor fa fashion. And then this little company called F5, which, you know, Jeff Husey, who's the founder of that company, um, he, he was out fundraising and he wasn't a typical CEO. He was actually a Wall Street banker before that and super smart, but maybe not as polished as other CEOs might look when they're fundraising. And he, he didn't have any offers, which was kind of surprising. I mean, he, he had an investment bank that was willing to put some money in, but he didn't have any like real Silicon Valley like term sheets. And, um, and it was just so obvious to me. And so, of course, I did the deal with my friend Kim King, who is African-American and a venture capitalist, which is very, very rare. She's the real unicorn. And um, we did the deal. And then we, we had two women on the board out of a board of five. And nobody even thought to take a picture. Isn't that funny? We didn't even think that way. You know, it's really funny. But anyway, the company went public. It still is public. It's still is the leading company in the space. Other questions? Well, I'll ask one. Um, we were talking a little bit about this earlier, and this is for both of you. Um, you know, we've talked about you need to see it in order to be it. And, and if you see women in leadership, then you realize what is possible. However, with younger industries, oh, it's younger industries, younger generations, we're looking at how they are influenced now. And it's not necessarily by an older generation. They are looking sideways to each other. As Sonia mentioned, they might be looking at themselves. I mean, social media has such a, an impression. Now, how do you or how do we continue to inspire them and mentor them if they're not even looking to us. Maybe they're looking, you know, younger than themselves or in their circle of friends. Well, I think, um, you know, the book is one thing, but I think reaching a broader audience, uh, which is why I'm super excited about the television series and the, and the adaptation, just to reach a very broad commercial audience that I may not reach, uh, although I would like to, with the book alone. The Talks at Google will help. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, to, you know, tell everyone about, about the book and read the book now. Um, so I think getting it out into the, into the mass media and just again, you know, to, I, I'm, I am a storyteller. I am a believer in the power of stories to change lives. And I believe that with my heart and soul. And I can prove that actually with many, many instances, things that I've written about where it, it is profoundly impactful. And so again, going back to tell your stories, you know, men and women and raise the stories of women up and make the success stories of women uh, more prevalent. So that's what I would say to that question. Um, exposure. Sonia, anything to add? Yeah, well, I, if I have the answer, it might help my daughter too. Um, uh, you know, I think Jillian's right. It's just getting the stories out. But like for me, what I try to do to influence younger people is I'm the founder of Project Glimmer. And our mission is to inspire at-risk teenage girls and women to believe in themselves by letting them know their community cares. And we give them jewelry and makeup. Like we do a program for foster girls where first thing they do is they get their hair and their makeup done and we take a beautiful photograph because that's interesting to them, right? And then later we have the messages about, you know, networking and believing in yourselves and all that because, you know, society is telling women and girls, you've got to look beautiful at all times. But then we all know in our hearts, like, no, it's really what's on the inside. But, but th these, these young women are getting so many mixed messages. So we're like, sure, we want you to look beautiful. So you'll feel great about yourself. And then we'll tell you why the inside is so important. And so that's my trick. And I think it's working. 
And it also for boys, with the 12-year-old son, we have yeah. the same problem with, so I think it is a generational thing for these young people. I do want to, I, I've got two more questions. Um, one of them is, if someone, even those of us in our mid-career, like myself, had a great idea, how would we get it to Broadway Angels? You have to know somebody. Huh. Um, <laughs> you do. And so so it's it's funny. So one, because you, you would imagine how many proposals we would get if, if, I mean, if we just got things cold. So one of the criteria is in order to show a deal as a member of Broadway Angels, you have to be an investor in the deal yourself already and seriously considering or seriously considering the deal. And so all the time wasting, you know, things just don't just don't show up to Broadway Angels. And so it's all about networks like it's pretty easy to, to know one of us. I mean, there's 52 of us, right? So, and, and just, just reach out and, um, and then convince one or two of us to invest or seriously consider investing. And that's how you get in. And I believe there is information. Well, I know Broadway Angels on, on your website, you have information to contact you and, and send you information. And of course, Julian's got her contact information in the um, author's note at the end of the book as well. So for stories there that are compelling. Um, I, the final question I'd love to ask both of you is who as a woman, you know, um, of influence today, should we be looking to for inspiration, encouraging others to look to? I think it's more accessible again. I think we should not be looking to someone, you know, um, that we don't know. I think we should be applauding those who are in our midst. Um, you know, our, our moms, our grandparents, our sisters, our female colleagues, um, the women who I write about, I think, as I said, are extraordinary, uh, real life role models, but really look for those in your life, in your, um, in your own career who have made a difference. So that's where I find it again, going back to being accessible, being real, uh, lifting other women up and finding inspiration with those who are right around you. I agree. I think the media and movie stars and pop culture, they get way too much influence for what they bring to society. So just people that you know that are doing cool things. I agree with Julian. And there are a lot of them there. Thank you so much, Julian Guthrie, Sonia Perkins, for being with us today. Please check out Alpha Girls, and we look forward to having uh, another talk at Google soon.